welcome to another session in the 2021 Online Student Development Conference. I'm Maria Tarko, I'm Chair of the Student Council, and with me today, my fellow members, Enyo Tembe, he's all the way from Mozambique, and also fellow council member Mpumi Maringa, she's a local girl. And uh, our very special guest for today is Salso Sambin, uh, but without stealing Enyo's thunder, he is the host for today. So he is going to do a full welcome to our presenter. Uh, take it away, Enyo. Yes. Good morning, everybody. I'm Enyo. Welcome to the Student Development Conference 2021. Here I will present Celsus Bio. Celsus Simbino is a maritime archaeology and at the end under underwater archaeology who has worked in coastal and underwater environment around Mozambique and USA in the Indian and Atlantic Oceans. In 2015, he extended his interest in, in, in intertidal research on, in, on Mozambique Island and later in, in underwater and marine environment use marine geophysics and diving in archaeological sites of Mozambican island and site courts at USA. He fulfilled uh, the, under, under, uh, the undergraduate degree at Eduardo Mondlane University uh, in two from 2011 to 2014 on archaeological material collected in the intertidal area of commercial purpose for tourists on Mozambican island. And Celso recently uh, fulfilled the Master of Science degree in archaeology at University of Cape Town uh, from 2019 to 2021 on chronological sequence of Mozambican island. Celso, there we go. Thank you. Wait yep. a minute. Yep. <clears throat> yes. May you please start your so yep. thank you for your presentation and for introducing Enyu. So today yep. we'll be here talking about archaeology of trade in the Eastern African coast and investigation on commercial approach of the Mozambique Island. This presentation is going to focus mainly in the chronological time between uh, 12th century to 19th century. So before I go further for the results of my uh, investigation, I have to contextualize you guys about the geographic area where it's located in Mozambique. So as it's a, it has a name of the country, it's Mozambique Island has a, uh, it's located in the, in the country which is called Mozambique, but it, this name comes from a very long history, which I'm very happy to share with you now. So this island is a very small island, which is located in the northern of Mozambique, uh, at Nampula province. It's a very small island, as you can see here, which is sketch, just sketch three kilometers long by 500 meters wide and as you can see here although it is a, it was a oh it is a very small island it was a very important i'm sorry it was a very important island in the connectivity of, uh, of long distance trade we have here surrounded by um, 24 ship wrecks identified you know and a lot of these ship wrecks that were identified here in this island a lot of them, they were related to the long distance trade and regional trading in the Eastern African coasts, as you can see. So one of the questions that can be asked, why a lot of ship rigs are concentrated here in the north side of the island? So it's going to be explained in the further sli slides of the presentations. So as you can see here in this uh, dot, uh, this uh, blue dot, Mozambique Island is here, located in Nampula province between Nakala and Angosh in the northern side of, uh, in the northern coast of Mozambique. So uh, during this 
the, the, these long distance trade connections and the, the, the diverse the, um, cultural interaction this island have been received. Uh, the sentiment that have been formed there in that island, although it's a small, it created very two distinctive um, urban features, which is called actually in the north side of this island is a stone town, which is, man, is uh, mainly characterized by Manuelin style architecture of a stone house. Mm. So when you go there in the island actually and you do some ethnographic work, the local community, the um, Swahili people that are there, they used to call this northern side of the island that this is a European uh, side of the island. Because even in this tissue of uh, sentiment formation, this, uh, this part of the island was settled mainly by Europeans like Portuguese who were there. And from 16th century onward until 19, they were in charge to run the trade that was taking place here in the main harbor. I made here some case so that you, you can see the main like the, 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 the main buildings that they characterize this island. We have here the red marker, which means that which shows that this is the main harbor where the, 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 the commerce or the long the long the, 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 the trade used to take place. And we have here the fortress, which is the fortress. Its name is uh, Fortaleza at San Sebastião. This is one of the emblematic buildings of the Portuguese occupation in the Eastern African coast. And also we have a couple of uh, Nossa Senhora de Baluarte, which shows the sprint or the, the, the sentiment of Christianism in this island. So we have here in downside, like in the south of the Mozambique Island, we have a Makut town. This Makut town is usually always typically known, which belongs the site was uh, centered by locals. And those people who use it to serve for the colonizers of the, you know, the Portuguese, in this, which I mean. And this is centered by local people, like local Swahili, not foreigners since the, century, the 17th century. How it, how it happened? Um, as here, we have the, the, the main harbor, which is the, located in the north. All the people in the beginning of settlement of this island, they wanted to send where the trade was taking place. But when the Portuguese came, because of the commercial conflicts or commercial interest in the trade, the Portuguese seems like it says that they push it out or they sent away those Arabics and those Makwas that were settling or in Swahili that were settled in the North area. And they started to build their own settlements in the North sites where actually it's a uh, Makut tower. So, the, the north side was taken over uh, by Portuguese. So as you can see, like why this island, although it's a small, but it uh, served for the long distance trade for a long time, it has a very nice or very protective channel, as you can see here. I have here this red star, which is the port. You can see here this very deep, very deep, or very um, uh, blue. Yeah, this is the very down channel we have here. Although it says that it's a shallow, but it measurements five, four, four, five meters down, which is a very excellent for the passage of big ships that uh, use it to anchor here in this island, which we're coming for the trade. And here we have a very good uh, deep um, banks, which are suitable also for the anchorage of um, ships. But it was a very dangerous um, harbor also, because it was surrounded by coral stones and shells. So these coral stones and shells, they were very suitable so that uh, a lot of um, ships that were sailed by an experienced 
pilots or people or unexperienced sailors or, or sailors that are not aware about the demography or the, 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 the physical geographic features of underwater environment of this island, easily they could even break their ships and eventually they used to sink here. Therefore, actually when we dive or when we run geophysical surveys, we find here a lot of shipwrecks or a lot of evidence of shipwrecks that were not successful here in this area when they wanted to encourage and they, sometimes they wanted to depart with some trade goods going for other areas to do trade. However, it was good because it's a close, which is a very close channel where if you succeed to anchor your, 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 the ship here and decide, even though if it comes a very strong storm, it was protected because it's a very close or it's a very interior bay here in, in Missouri. <clears throat> this area, this island is also mentioned that probably might have participated in the earlier medieval uh, trade roads. So some of this or some indications of its participation comes or it's mentioned in the document, which is a pre plus deritracy and plutonium geographics. These are the two documents, all very old documents, which mention places that might have participated in the long distance trade between the first century to five century. However, as you know, the commerce activities, they have the potential places where by time, they are central place which runs this commerce. As you can see here, I have this area which are marked by red, which means that in this period, these were the core area where the trade has taken place. And this trade were not only connected through the Indian Ocean, but also it worked through the terrestrial uh, roads. And these areas, these roads are contemporary to Silk Road, the famous Silk Road, which linked the Far East to the rest of the world. As you can see here, that there is um, places that are linked from Europe, Asia, and Africa using oceans and terrestrial roads um, and trading products or exchanging products like tortoiseshell, iron, resonant horns, spices, aromatics, gemstones, wheat, rice, sugar, oil, butter, powder, weapons, and ceramics. And also there is uh, some comments which are related to slavery which means that the commerce of slave is not something that started recently or as it's most known that uh, the slavery or the trade of slave, the economy of slave is something that was done or started with Europeans, but no, it was done even in the very earlier time or very previous, long time ago, okay. So when the time changes, Sometimes because of the ongoing growing interest of um, trade, what happens is that more core areas of trade uh, have, 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 have uh, occurred, like new areas also that were very were core place of, of, of trade emerged, uh, which means that between 16 to 9, between 16, to ninth century, or which I, I we call it mid medieval period, and it's more related or is more said or stated in the Arabic source. It emerged new places, even in Africa, in the Eastern African coast. We started to have places like Marka, Barwa, Sanga, Manda, and Kila also, and Comor Island, which were places also were deeply gated in the long distance uh, trade. And I also uh, could understand something in my reading that because of uh, this uh, interest, uh, growing interest in trade, other places, they were even taken over by new traders. And also it made 
created the, the, the situation of places, they have changed the names. And it sometimes can struggle when you are doing like your archive research because places when they change the names archaeologically, sometimes you can find some slight difficult to identify them. If you don't have all the history well studied, and it also created the situation that new port uh, or new markets have also emerged because of a growing history of um, uh, <clears throat> of trade. As you can see in this period between sixth and ninth century, Africa was the main source of gold, iron, ivory, and slaves, and they used to give these uh, kind of products in the change of paper, sugar, cottons, and precious stones that were coming from uh, Middle East of uh, Asia. And also or sometimes it was a change by silk, ginger, porcelains, and perfumes coming from far east of Asia. And this trade also it was taking place through Indian Ocean routes and also Crystal roads. Let on uh, between um, uh, around 12th century, there is likely a geographer who is called uh, Al Idris, who has drafted a map or has drawn a map which is uh, of the, which is dated to century 12. Now, this is the most uh, well uh, drawn or well found. Uh, map that has an indication of Mozambique Island. But as I said, the names of our time, they used to change of the places now. So this is the map which the area where actually we call it Mozambique Island. In this time of the uh, 12th century, it was called the dam. And it eventually, when you pay attention on the, its location, it coincide very well with what actually we call Muslim guidance. So this area we marked or we mentioned has the very important area of trade, which they used to provide and also buy some or exchange some products that were important in the long distance trade system. So it shows that until the century 12, the Mozambique Island was broadly incorporated with the other areas or connected, connected with other places uh, with the interests of doing trade, offering their product, uh, its product and also receiving prestige or exotic products that were coming overseas. So later on in the European period, which is called mainly is known by the famous road which taken place after Carrera das and after Silk Road is called Carrera das Indias. So Carrera das Indias, it was a road or long distance um, trade road that linked Europe, Africa, and India. Okay. So as the Portuguese, they arrived here in the end of um, uh, 15th century. When they found they arrived at the end of the coast, they found out that there was a very development Swahili markets, which the main products of uh, trade were glass beads, clothes, spices, and imported ceramics from Gulf Persia and Asia. So it was exchanged for gold that was uh, mimic in Africa, ivory, precious woods, Pearls, seeds, and turtle shell, and animal skins, amber, and elephant oils, and other medicinal plants that we have here, and also uh, slaves and cotton. So this interested too much the Portuguese, and they decided to settle here in the Eastern African coast, and they took over the power of some Arabics and some Swahili people that were running the trade here in this coast. So because of this interest of, of um, trade, also it raised a, like a competition, commercial competition, because everyone, they wanted to run 
this uh, a scenario of a trade it's for the um, capitalism accumulation. <clears throat> so as we know that Mozambique Island was a very small island which just sketched three kilometers by uh, 500 meters. Uh, a lot of resources that were traded there, eventually it's sure that they were coming from mainland. So with the interest of Europeans and also the, the, the growing of the advent of uh, Islam here, so the necessity of uh, trading slaves, it grew because people, they got interested in the economy of the slaves. They started to uh, conduct or start doing some raids in the mainland so that they can call the ant people and trade them as slaves so that they can feed this economy of uh, slavery. And because of it, roads were created so that they could bring slaves from the mainland to the coast so that they could be even be loaded in the ship and taken overseas to the for the trade. And because of it, the slaves that were taken uh, somewhere in Mozambique and the other part of Africa, mainly the written documents, most of them, they indicated that this economy of slave was mostly strong between Africa and United States of America, or even South of America. Uh, so it might also explain the origins or and even the development of Black Americans that exist actually in America. As you can see, the growing of this um, uh, of this industrial this economy, it might have intensified from the mid of uh, 15th century to 7th century, and might have taken place intensively when the, the over times, you know, until the end of the first half of the 19th century when a lot of, of uh, African um, countries with the help of UK or actually England succeeded to start the abolition process of uh, slavery. So as here we can see until the end of 19th century, the Mozambique island might have been, might have established a global trade or commercial interactions with almost all over the world. Therefore, I even say like a, this is a, a trade approach, which I want to discuss in, in, in this uh, uh, presentation. <clears throat> so, one of the consequences that it is, uh, another consequence that this uh, uh, commercial approach might have brought to for this island is the increasing of the sentiment. As I said, the sentiment around the uh, 17th century, it might have started main, prim, mainly here in the north side, immediately close or immediately very near to the harbor where the main uh, commercial activity have taken place. As it happens, even actually, a lot of us, when we go to central somewhere, we want to central a place where we're going to be near of activities that uh, are economic so that we can have a control or easy access to the market. And 100 years later, or something, 150 years later, the sentiment have also continued growing, expanding to towards the south of the island. Now, as you can see here, uh, these red marks are buildings that were uh, continually uh, constructed there on the island so that might serve for the uh, occupation of the people. So somewhere in the 19th century, we can see that the occupation even started to take place in the south of Mozambique Island, where actually is the Maput area. And in the earlier 20th, uh, 20th century, we can see that almost 19% uh, uh, 
of the island was uh, occupied. You know, all area of the northern side was always full occupied, and the, 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 the south also was very much expanded by or centered by uh, Mako people or Swahili people. Mm. And 10 years later of the independence, we can even say that the island was all, it all was it all occupied by the, the Swahili people and actually the, the, the Makwa people. And we can say that this island it needs, suggests that it can be receiving actually more and more research because however it is very small, it is not fully yet a completed research. It has more than 500 history of cultural, social, and economic, and the political history that needs to be researched more and more and with better uh, technology so that it can improve our understanding of this history, that long history that have taken place in this small island. Yeah. <clears throat> Behind underwater archaeological sites, we also have like in vertical areas, which when you walk during the low tide, you can easily even identify archaeological material. These archaeological material, they are removed from the shipwrecks that are there submerged. When the, high, the tide is high, the waves or the, the, the underwater dynamics of like waves, they remove some archaeological materials and they deposited them here in this area, which we call intertidal areas. And when the tide goes down, when it's a low tide, they are deposited here. And the local communities, they even spend their af afternoons and their mornings devoting to collect these archaeological materials so that they can even do jewelers and like necklaces to sell for the tourists. So they are collected for selling purpose. And beyond archaeological material, you find in the interstellar areas and underwater areas. Also, in on the main on the island, we have uh, the Eduardo Mondragon University Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. I've started to do excavations in the 1994, and even the last excavation before these uh, difficulties of COVID. In 2019 was the last excavation. And as you can see here, these numbers I have here, these are the distributions of uh, test pits that they have uh, taken place that have been dug since uh, uh, 1994 until now. And we didn't, we didn't yet succeed to dig all the island. And we're still having a lot of doubts about the history of this island. So we have several test pits that have been opened here. Even me, I, I did excavation for my masters in this island. So as you can see, this island is very rich in terms of uh, archeological contest and historical contest that is still in process, in an ongoing process of being studied. So the assemblage of this exemplar assemblage of material culture that have been recovered, mainly these are material that are related, more related to Swahili people that like locals, indigenous people of this island, where we have very diverse types of ceramics. But one of the very emblematic one are, are carinated open bowls, which uh, they're related to rice cooking or food waste. Like in this island, one of very emblematic uh, food ways of the Swahili culture is a uh, rice cooking. So some ethnographic works that have been conducted we seen that actually in the present day, in the present day, people they do these ceramics, the carinated ceramics for cooking rice. And when you ask them why you prefer to cook rice with this kind of specific or this specific ceramics, the answer is very common, which is says that this is something that we were taught by our ancestors. So we're trying to keep doing it because even when you cook a, a rice in these uh, pots, 
the rust is going to taste better than when you cook in the metal pans. So this is a, something that you find in archaeological contests and also in the present day activities when people they craft their, 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 their objects. You still find people that they do, although actually they don't decorate anymore, but the shape is identical. And we have also another types of uh, ceramics, which are jars and platters. But in this whole assemblage, which is here, this, the one that is still being produced actually, something very fun, is this one, the number six, which is carinated ceramic. One of the uh, 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 excavation that was undertaken by a teacher of mine, who is Ricardo Chere Duarte, at his house, yield a very question mark uh, uh, evidence, which is a beside uh, ceramics. This kind of ceramic is mainly known to date from century eight to century fifth. So this is a ceramic that is a susceptible to Sassan ceramic, like after Sassan ceramic comes abaside. And this Sassan ceramic were found at Chibuen, a site which is found in the south of Mozambique at uh, Nyamban province. Uh, so finding this kind of uh, evidence then in, in the Mozambique island and Chibuen, it means that it strength the idea that Mozambique might have participated in the long distance trade a long time ago, more than it was thought. Like before this excavation, we had no clue of any evidence that shows or that can give indication to say that Mozambique Island even participated in the long distance trade before Central 12. But now we have a possibility to rise this evidence that the Mozambique Island might have very built, uh, might have been a, engaged in the commerce of this um, Abbasside ceramic, which comes from uh, a place where actually is Syria, Iraq, Baghdad, that area of Middle East. And possibly is even say that the inspiration of uh, the, the of uh, Abbasid dynasty ceramic might have given inspiration for the production of Tang dynasty ceramics, which my was started to be made in the central ten because these kind of ceramics were very famous and commercially very important. So they were even trade not only in, in, in Africa, but also they were traded in the Far East, where is uh, China. <clears throat> Other kind of uh, uh, ceramics that are very commonly known that are found on Mozambique Island, and they strength the idea that this island was very participant and very active in the long distance trade, is the finding of the Chinese and European porcelains that of uh, Ming Dynasty, so King Dynasty, the two dynasties that are very famous in the selling their products, uh, their, like their porcelains in the network uh, system of long distance trade that have taken place in the Indian Oceans. So the emergence of the importance of these two dynasties, uh, Ming Dynasty mainly, is said that might have given inspiration for the production of Fiance, which is a fiance, is a mostly known, vulgarly commonly known um, European porcelain, which will are very uh, frequently found in the excavations of Mozambique Island. Beyond ceramics, imported ceramics, we also have different kind of beads. We have even this one is a gold bead. You still find like a bead made by gold. And also we even find frequently European uh, beads. And also we have some other beads that are frequently found, which are very related to slavery contests, which are made locally, which are uh, made by coral stone. So the coral stone was used also to make beads. And also there are beads made by shell, like very small shells that were uh, used also to make uh, 
uh, necklace. And these local beads are mainly associated in the literature with the slavery contest, which means that also slaves, they had their own objects. Beside these objects, my uh, exotic objects that were brought to for the accumulation of capital for the rich people, all those people who had the opportunity to run the, the commerce. Beside that, we also have like remnants of Swahil culture, architecture, evidence that shows that because of this tendency of um, occupying the coastal areas, people have to uh, have uh, sentiments like houses and a lot of the stone houses built by coral stones that are mainly related to the Swahil domination in the coast. And to build this house, these people they had to mean like stones go to the area where they could quarry these stones so that they could build these houses. So eventually it might have caused some environment change, like a built environment, because people had to explode this coral or this coastal area so that they can have a possibility to build these houses. And just one of the places that were excavated is a um, Burazak family, which this family is known since uh, by uh, like oral tradition there on the island that they had, they were rich family who their ancestor, they had a capacity to have uh, slaves. They, they were traders of slaves. So they had connections with the Europeans so that they could, facilitated these leaders. And they say that his house is a place, is a place where he stored slaves for a long time before they come to be taken by uh, Europeans, which archeologically it was not proven, but it seems like these people, they had their domestic slaves because they were even like rich people at that time, because even the remains like these remnants a very huge or very big uh, houses, which shows that they were not sponsored by someone who might we can call poor, but was someone influent in this area of Mozambique Island. And a lot of important material, like exotic material, were found here in this uh, house or in this excavation. And we also found uh, underneath a structure which shows that behind this uh, structure that's here, visible. When you dug, you even find another structure underneath it, and it yielded a lot of uh, ceramics, like imported ceramics, like uh, uh, glass beads, uh, and those I showed previously, like Chinese ceramics and European ceramics, which shows that this house was a receptive of exotic or prestige material. So as my statement remarks, I have to say that the trade, the impact of this trade uh, connective and exchange then Mozambique Island might have affected the culture of the Eastern African coast, uh, the economy. It changed from being the red of redistribution of wealth to accumulation of the wealth so that people they started to be eager in terms of getting more and more rich it brought new religions manifestation to assimilate Islam and Christianism. So people to be, to have a um, possibility to run trade, it seems that otherwise they had to be Muslim or had to be Christian so that they could have a capacity to know the language of doing trade. So if you do a trade, in the side of a Muslim area, you have to know Arabic or you have to know Swahili so that you can have a communication to do the trade. And also if you do a trade or run the trade while you are Christians, you will have the opportunity to know the Portuguese so that you can run uh, the trade. It's something like this happening with the English actually, actually in the places where you, for instance, Mozambique, when you are going to ask for work, the first thing that you are going to be asked is, how is your English? Which means that English actually is a commercial language. And in some time, somewhere in the past, 
uh, Arabic, Swahili, and Portuguese were commercial language also that have taken place or lead in some areas of the Eastern African coast so that you can have the opportunity to do a trade or part of make a, have a participation in this work. Additionally, it brought a demographic interest. A lot of people, they have got interest in this in settling the coastal areas so that they can have easy access in participating in it. So this increased demographic might have also brought, might have also brought some changes in the, the um, environment because people to settle this area, obviously they needed to clean the area, the forest that they found here so that they can have access of mangroves to, to build house. They can have as access to mangroves to build boats so that they can have access to coral stone to build the house, as I said previously, to also to collect a uh, um, shell and collect the shell so that they can produce cal to do their um, plasters of the house. Because a lot of houses that you find there on Mozart Island, they are plastered, but they are not plastered with cement, they are plastered with the cal, and the cal is made by shells. We also have a, we see also a formation of new cultural identities. It's already is mostly said, commonly said that the Swahili culture in the Eastern African coast is strongly related to the commercial or long distance trade influence. And finally, because of the need of guarantee uh, uh, to guarantee the, the serving of uh, the economy of slaves. People had to go to the interior lands to ride to, to conduct some raid seeking for slaves so that they can feed this economy of slaves so that they can guarantee also the participation of of, uh, of trades or the, the 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 participation in the global uh, commercial system of slaves that link at Europe Asia and uh, America. And thank you for your time, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, um, Salso. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll open up for questions. Uh, Enyo, do you have a question that you'd like to start off with? Can you come again? Um, I'm asking uh, Enyo if he might have any questions for you. Yes, I do. I don't know if I can ask for a question what you shared on the okay, WhatsApp group, or maybe you prefer to, to ask Marit. Um, No, no, I was thinking of um, uh, asking question three. So you can maybe any ask, uh, ask any of the other two. Okay. Now, for me, the question is, so, uh, before, I would like to say uh, thank you so much Cecil, for the wonderful presentation, which uh, make like it's very, it was very, very interesting to understand the interaction between different places. So the question is, how uh, about uh, Fofala, for example? I know that the focus is uh, of your presentation was about Mozambican Island. So my question is, uh, uh, what kind of information you can also share with us linking Mozambican Island and Sofala as well? Because I know that Sofala in Yembane as well was very, uh, very important, the center of trade as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Sofala is a very important place also to mention. I'm sorry if uh, I, I didn't mention that because mm -hmm. before the definitive or the definitive occupation of Mozambique Island. The Portuguese, when they arrived here in the Eastern African coast, in the beginning of the century 16, they tried to, to occupy Sofala. And their first uh, fortress, the fortress of Sofala, the first fortress they, they, they built in the Eastern African coast was Sofala. But they understood, they realized that building a, a fortress there in Sofala to control the trade was a mistake because the port of Sofala was not that much suitable for their big ships. And they had to be dependent on the small dows, those small dows of uh, uh, 
Swahili people that were there so that they could be intermediate the trade and so that they can offload their cargoes that comes from big ships so that they can reach so far that they needed to be dependent on those small dows. And behind that, that port of Sofala was progressively being eroded by the advantage of the sea waters. Other side, Sofala only offered one source of um, gold control. When people felt that the, the Portuguese, they were there controlling the gold system trade, they changed their route of um, gold that were mimicked in the interior, like Great Zimbabwe. It was no longer sent to Sofala, but it was sent to another places because this kind of things of uh, commerce or trade was not something that people were very happy to be controlled. You know, so they wanted the freedom to control their own capitals. But the Portuguese, when they came, one of their aim of building a fortress there was having control of every kind of trade that was taking place there. So shortly, the Portuguese, they also abandoned the Sofala and started going to the, the, the Mozambique island because they realized that Mozambique island will be very clever and a very, how can I say it in, in English, but is a, a passage that all kind of ships going to India or going to Nyamban, they will pass by there. So controlling Mozambique island, building another fortress, which is a San Sebastian fortress there in Mozambique Island, they will have a control of uh, all the system there. There will be a very important passage, uh, uh, passage way or passage port where all the ship, they will go there to reload water, to reload supplies, to reload even like ship, ship mending, like fix, fixing the, the ships. So going to Mozambique Island will be better for them instead of Sofal, which means that Sofal also was important because that was their first attempt of settling the Eastern African coast. Okay, cool. Thank you. So what about you, Maret? Do you have any question? Hello, Maret. Sorry, I didn't see I was muted. Um, uh, so, so, so um, as part of your presentation, you mentioned that um, some of the harbors or a lot of the harbors that are mentioned by the Arabic historian Al Adrisi um, have not been confirmed by, by archaeological research. Would you actively encourage researchers from other SADC countries to come to Mozambique to do research? Yeah, I would because this kind of a, the, the, the name is there is a science which helps archaeology in understanding the change of things. We call it toponymy in Portuguese. I don't know any if you can help me to translate it. Toponymia, yeah, yeah. it's a toponymia. The change, the names always change, and sometimes you can even find a site which actually we can say that okay, Mozambique Island it coincide with the dam, but we might probably not be right that the dam, the dam, that the dam is there. We we are just doing inference. Why? Because sometimes we have uh, problems of uh, translated documents. A lot of documents we have already translated. And we know that translations also, they are subjective sometimes. And in archaeology, we have very much this kind of discussion of saying, ah, I found out it. And can come another one saying that it's not what you think that you found. Your question, it goes very similar to a contest of a very famous place which is called Rapta. And we we'll discuss a lot of this place of Rapta in Africa is uh, Felix Cham, who says that he had found Rapta and probably Rapta is in Tanzania. Yeah. And in some point, there are some people who says that uh, the people is very trade documents, they are not, uh, they don't mention Mozambique Island, the, the people is very trade, they mention until Tanzania, because Tanzania is the end of Silk Road. 
but in sometimes you also find some others which says that the Silk Roads also go might have gone until Shibuan because Shibuan will have evidence or uh, which is related to the Central 80 or Central 6. So as I mentioned, there is still a lot of job that needs to be done. And if someone comes is interested with it, can come is welcome. As long as has collaborate with us, we can do like a joint work you know, together. Oh, yeah. thank, thank you for that, Salsa. So to the students listening and thinking about research projects, uh, remember, don't limit yourself to the country that you're in. You know, there's a lot of other places where you can go and excavate. So reach out through your own institution, of course, reach out and see if there are any uh, collaborative <coughs> opportunities where you can actually, you know, different universities like to collaborate. You might get an opportunity to go and, you know, excavate in Mozambique and even um, help with some of that translation work. It seems that there's still a lot of, of ethnographic and historical work that also needs to be done uh, in terms of the research along the East African trade network. Um, so, Salsa, thank you very, very much for this session today. Um, it, it has been a great honor uh, to have you on as one of our guest lectures. Inya, also thank you very much for, for tuning in and sitting in as the host uh, for today. Then to the students tuning in, remember to complete the quiz that's associated with this uh, presentation. And once again, Salsa, thank you so very much uh, for joining thank us. You. Thank you. All right, everyone have a fantastic day further. Bye.